Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting the ministry through your prayers and all of your works, the things that you have in your heart. <clears throat> it truly is a blessing. Um, a great revela revelation, <clears throat> though really no surprise. The Lord put it on my heart that this year, for the rest of the year and the next, our focus in this ministry of divine mercy is going to be on the family, healing in the family. The more I prayed and pondered, the more sense it gave to me. So there are two lessons today, one with two messages, I should say. One from the Diary of St. Faustina, and the second from the book that I wrote, A Call to Trust, A Revelation from Jesus. So we'll begin with St. Faustina. Take this to your own heart, um, maybe in your own family situation, family members, um, those that are closest to us, we hurt the most sometimes and are hurt by us. St. Faustina says in Notebook 3, Entry 1150, Today I experienced a great deal of sorrow from a certain person. On the basis of one true thing, she said many things that were fictitious. And because they were taken to be true and spread around the whole house, when the news reached my ears, my, my heart felt a twinge of pain. How can one abuse the goodness of others like that? But I resolved not to say a word in my defense and to show even greater kindness toward that person. I became aware, however, that I was not strong enough to bear this calmly because the matter lingered on for weeks. How many can identify with this? <laughs> How many? I can't take it anymore. I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. Boy, you're going to have it. That's not what she says. I resolved not to say a word in my defense and to show even greater kindness towards that person. I became aware, however, that I was not strong enough to bear this calmly because the matter lingered on for weeks. Do I even say years? When I saw the storm building up and the wind beginning to blow, sand straight into my eyes, I went before the Blessed Sacrament and said to the Lord, Lord Jesus, I ask you to give me the strength of your actual grace, actual grace, because I feel that I, I will not manage to survive this struggle. Shield me with your breast. <coughs> then I heard these words. Do not fear, I am with you. When I left the altar, an extraordinary peace and power filled my soul. And the storm that was raging broke against my soul as against a rock. And the, form, and the foam of the storm fell on those who had raised it. Oh, how good is the Lord, who will reward each one according to his deed. Let every soul beg for the help of actual grace, actual grace, actual grace. As sometimes, ordinary grace is not enough. That really shows us the need in our own deficiency to ask God for even greater the, the greater ability to practice deeper virtue. And asking in these kinds of times when our nerves are raw with whatever it may be, <coughs> irritation, misunderstanding, whatever the case may be, when we would lash out or say things we would regret later. 
St. Faustina shows us the right path, and we're all guilty of it. Shows us the right path. Go before the Blessed Sacrament. When you come before the Blessed Sacrament, you come before the throne of God. He who alone can do all things in us. And we ask him not, oh Lord, help me alone. We ask him specifically for actual grace. That great grace which descends on us from heaven in great abundance and with uh, a very deep, deep, deep power to help us to see past the person or people who are hurting us and, or who we have hurt. Because sometimes when we, when we hurt somebody, right or wrong, we get so tangled up into the emotional stuff that sometimes even when we're trying to apologize or fix it, it gets even messier. And then more junk comes out. So it's really critical, especially in family situations where we feel so free to express ourselves, where it's so easy to hurt the ones we love because we know they love us. But it does last, those memories last some, for a lifetime sometimes. It's really important to go to the one who can really change. One time, well, one time when I was very young, um, my parents, especially my mom, always believed in us children doing chores. I remember my mother, as I was a little girl, teaching me how to wash the windows, the ones I could reach, go up and down, you don't go in circles, you don't leave streaks, all that kind of stuff. She, she did, you know, we had to do that. She taught me how to iron, she taught me how to mend, and my brothers learned things from her and my father. So a lot of times, you know, our friends would come over knocking on the door to play and whatever, and we weren't allowed to go out. We had chores to do. And after our chores were done, then we can play. <clears throat> this one particular day, I finally finished doing whatever the chores were, and I went out to play, and I was so excited because just a few houses down, I saw some of my girlfriends in the driveway um, chatting, whatever. So as I approached them, I realized they were arguing. Something, something was off. And so I was just standing there, and the, the, it got louder and louder. And then one started picking on the other and so on. So the mother came out of the house uh, of whose driveway we were standing on. And what is going on and back and forth. And so I just got there. I was just listening to them, trying to figure out what was going on. I probably was only about eight years old or something. And, um, and they, were, they were scared to death because she was a big woman and she was, you know, and so um, who started this? Who? And she said, well, um, someone, you know, I was called whatever, bad name or whatever. And well, who said it? And so they all pointed to me. <laughs> I was accused. And I, I didn't even know what was actually going on. And so, of course, you know, I said, I didn't, I didn't do anything. I don't, I, mean, I don't even know what's going on here or whatever. And so they all accused. I mean, I was the scapegoat here, right? And so I was taken home to my house. And back in those days, parents didn't yell or get in the face of other parents. They believed that if the parents were saying something, they were probably right. And so I got in trouble, and I was punished. And I kept trying to convince my mother and father that I didn't say anything, I didn't do. And, you know, they just, it was a wait and see kind of thing. So in the meantime, I was not allowed to play with any of the other children. And there were a few of the neighbors who thought that I was really a bad girl for saying such bad words to this person. And, you know, I never forgot that because I was innocent, number one. And secondly, I couldn't forget how all of them accused me. That was really weird. But, you know, it was a beginning. And as miserable as that was at some eight years old, it was preparation. God allowed it because it was preparation for what I would have to go through down the road and how I would grow stronger and hold my ground. Anyway, in the long and short of it, something, some of the mothers figured something out and it came out, the truth came out of the, real, the person who did it confessed and um, they apologized to me and so on and so forth. 
many years later, and this is how we need to see and understand sometimes how God works and how at the time it may not make sense to us. Nothing happens without God knowing it or allowing it. A lot of stuff happens because the world has evil within it. In this particular circumstance, however, I believe God allowed it to strengthen me in future um, circumstances. When I would have to stand up and say, the Lord spoke to my heart and he's calling us to go out into the land and bring to every home a caramel apple, representing the sweetness of Christ, only to find out that at the end of that journey, someone's life actually depended on it. Had we not gone out that day, he would have died. In many other situations, God raised me in those difficult situations. He allowed them to strengthen me. And it gave me that courageous fortitude that even when things did not look like what we thought or what should be happening, even when things didn't make sense, that in the depths of our whole heart and soul, when we know we are just, to stand tall, and just like St. Faustina says, as this, the wind was blowing the sand against her and all of that, it's what it feels like when you're in that kind of a battle, a spiritual battle, to stand and hold your ground and to be strong and to go before God and ask him for the actual grace that we need. As I got older and faced even more, <clears throat> for sure, serious situations where my integrity would come to be in check, if you will, or um, tested, in a situation where everyone at the table in ministry, everyone at the table was in total disagreement and, uh, and things were just totally out of order. And I reached that point of saying to the Lord, I can't take it anymore. All hell is gonna break loose in one moment. If you don't give me the actual grace, oh God, to be a servant of your mercy. God gave me a vision in the midst of that, and he can do that, of a pelican. Do you know what a pelican does? Even in our, our, our church, you'll see throughout churches, um, statues or paintings or whatnot of a pelican. A pelican mother, when her children are starving and there's no food, will peck at her own breast and feed her pelican babies their flesh, her flesh, so that the father doesn't eat out of hunger the little ones. <clears throat> God gave me that vision of what he was expecting of me. When we know something from God, whatever God appoints, like be a pelican, God was appointing me to be that pelican, he anointed me to do what the pelican does, and he'll do the same for you. When God calls you to have courageous fortitude, when he calls you to silence instead of battle, when he asks that you be a servant of his mercy, because the fact is, unless you have the ability to read souls all the time, like God, and none of us can. Some are gifted for certain times and certain people in certain circumstances, but only God does that for the most part. Unless you can read somebody's mind and unless you've walked in their shoes for the number of years that they've walked in their shoes and suffered the persecutions that that person has suffered, we learn to be silent because behind closed doors, Nobody knows the suffering of what another human being truly goes through. And we need to allow each other to live life in the best way we know how. There is good and there is better. God calls us to be better than what's out there in the world. 
everything can be accomplished by the actual grace that God gives us. First going to his throne, not judging. Sometimes because of our own emotional things, we think people are saying things or doing things. They don't even know we're alive, hardly. <clears throat> it's important to do what St. Faustina did. Go before God, pray for actual grace that he would give you the wisdom and the piety to be a servant of his mercy. That doesn't mean stupid. Don't mistake that. Because with mercy, there's justice. It gives us that good, healthy balance to make the calls in our life that we need to make without being ugly people or harming someone else, maybe even for a lifetime. St. Faustina, with, with the rest of this part, says <clears throat> a beautiful prayer. When pain overwhelms my soul and the horizon darkens the night, and the heart is torn with the torment of suffering, Jesus crucified, you are my strength. When the soul dimmed with pain exerts itself in battle without respite, and the heart is in agony and torment, Jesus crucified, you are the hope of my salvation. And so the days pass, and the soul bathes in a sea of bitterness and the heart dissolves in tears. Jesus crucified, you shine for me like the dawn. And when the cup of bitterness brims over and all things conspire against her, and the soul goes down to the garden of olives, Jesus crucified, in you is my defense. When the soul, conscious of its innocence, accepts these dispensations from God, the heart can repay, then repay hurts with love. The heart can then repay hurts with love. And may I even add, I forgive you. Jesus crucified, transform my weakness into omnipotence. Do you see the message the Lord is giving to St. Faustina to us through her? If our focus is on Jesus and our trust is in him, it's not about the other person anymore. It goes right back to Jesus Christ. Because in the end, we are gonna stand before him and answer for all of these things. We should never be too big of a person to say, I forgive you. Or if someone asks us for forgiveness, no matter what, to extend forgiveness, even mercy. When we can do that, it shows clearly who our focus is really on. Because everything we do as an agent, if you will, of divine mercy a son or daughter of Jesus Christ wanting to get into heaven should be a reflection of him and for him. So it doesn't matter what face is on that situation. What matters is that everything we do, we do for him. Is it easy? Hell no. Are we called to it anyway? Like a pelican? Absolutely. Hands down. Everyone, everyone, without exception. Because the same way God wants us in heaven, he wants that person that hurt us or that we hurt, whatever, wants that person, his child, to be perfected in their lifetime and to go into heaven too. How do you feel when you know you've made a mistake and you, that the person you've hurt will not extend forgiveness to you. We've all said stupid things. 
We've all done really dumb things. How do you feel when someone is holding a grudge against you? And even over time, we all grow. I mean, if we're going to Mass regularly, if we're, we're aspiring to practice and live a sacramental life, we are growing. Unforgiveness is the worst thing that can happen. The measure that we extend in forgiveness to someone is what God will give to us. We should never ever be too big to say, I'm sorry, I messed up, I could have done it better. Now looking back, praying about it, pondering it, I can see maybe where you were, what you were thinking or whatever the situation is. It doesn't matter. Let's move on forward from here. <clears throat> That's what God calls us to. And great holiness happens in all of that. Finally, this is something very clearly and specifically that Jesus put on my heart and was confirmed. So often, because life is so busy, we go from one thing to the next pretty much without thinking. We get so wrapped up into what's going on and what we have to do and getting on to the next thing that it seems things come faster than what we could even handle. Blink an eye and it's already Christmas. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, we had Halloween and already in the stores, everything Thanksgiving is clearanced out. Christmas all over. Faster than what we could even take breaths for. This is when we need to be really careful. And I, I believe the, what, the reason why the Lord put this on my heart is because as we now are approaching Thanksgiving and Advent, we need to be very mindful <clears throat> prepared, armed for this time where we will be encountering family situations, friends, etc. When people don't have enough rest, <clears throat> excuse me, when we don't have enough quiet time, we become very cantankerous, short with each other, and most likely to say things and do things we normally wouldn't. We are so rushed. We'll take a dive out into traffic without thinking about the next person. We say things in family situations because we're tired and whatever, for whatever. This is what the Lord says. Keep this in mind as we are approaching Thanksgiving and Advent. Jesus says, Come to me, my sons and daughters. Lay your anxieties at my feet. He's saying, Stop worrying. Don't be chained up in, 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 in anxieties and fears. Lay your anxieties at my throne, the feet of my throne. Let's retreat away from the noise and the demands of this world. It is so difficult to exist on this earth at times. This I know well. Rest. A soul needs quiet in order to be restored and rest to be refurbished. Rest, sleep, prayer. Now, isn't that an interesting order? Rest, sleep, <coughs> prayer. See, he doesn't want you to come to him saying 20 Hail Marys as fast as you can. He wants you to rest. Get your rest. Let your body rest. Sleep. And then come. He doesn't want your leftovers. He wants your fresh and first fruits. And you awake from that. Give me that. I go with you always when you rest and when you sleep. So fear not. Hold your rosary or your cross or whatever it is in your hand when you go to sleep. Put it under your pillow. 
knowing full well Jesus is with you as you're doing all of that. And like St. Faustina, maybe offer up, let every beat of my heart beat with love for you. So even as you're sleeping, your heart's praying on your behalf. Jesus is present. <clears throat> Work for your provisions, yes, but do not become a slave to your work because of unnecessary extras. Are you listening? Work for your provisions, yes. Now think about Thanksgiving. Think about Advent and Christmas. Work. Don't be a slave to those presents. Don't be a slave to the 50 million extra things that are unnecessary, that tie you up and make you anxietous. So that when your family comes over or your friends, you're too tired for them, or you're grouchy because they didn't pick up their own dish. Hello. <laughs> Gather your family and be with them. You are the most important part of their well-being. What is in the heart of Christ is that you gather your family in that you are present to them. Do not waste time nagging or arguing. Is God listening? I mean, does he been at my house or what? <laughs> Do not waste time nagging or arguing. So he covered all the bases. Whichever category you fall in, if you're a nagger or an arguer, <laughs> don't waste time. Be with them. Let peace and love reign in your homes. It is hard to exist in this world for everyone. Come away from it. Make your home a loving retreat. My peace be with you. God is commissioning you here. He's calling you out, and why? Why? If you're sitting in this chapel today, or whenever you're here, on these grounds of this beautiful sanctuary of his divine mercy meant for our time, he's speaking to you. You are an ambassador of his mercy. And what he's doing is setting up how your homes and your families need to be. Because you are for him the connector of your family to him. And so if when they come to you or your home and they see and meet a cantankerous person who has 50 million cookies or every gift and whatever and tables full and house decorated, but you're short of breath, you're dead tired, and you're just doing your part this year because it's your turn to have it over or whatever the case may be. What holiness is in that? And yet we do it over and over again. So this is your assignment. For once, like the world, we're going to be ahead of things. And here, even before Thanksgiving, as we approach Thanksgiving, the season of Advent, a time for prayer. Now, prioritize. Make yourself a list and carve out the time every single day. Some portion of time for rest, for sleep, and for prayer. And that doesn't mean while you're laying down or sitting down that you're working. It means away from the world for a period of time and then give that first fruit to Almighty God and watch how the time opens up. Pockets of time will open up for you to do the most important things. Don't make it a list of the first 100 things you want to accomplish before November 23rd or December 3rd or whatever. What is most important? And imagine that this is going to be your last year. Maybe this will be your, your last Christmas. I don't care if you're two or 200. 
What if this was the last Christmas? How would you spend it? Don't walk away from here today without holding on to that. If this was your last Christmas, what would you do for your relationship with God and for your relationship with your family and your friends? Always keeping at the center of everything the crucifix. Jesus who gave everything for everyone. Not just the good people, not just the sweethearts, but all the porcupines too. He did it for everyone. If this were your last Thanksgiving and Christmas, how would you spend it? Because in the end, when you step over and you're looking into the eyes of Jesus Christ, he's not going to ask you how many perfect pies you made for Thanksgiving or how many presents you shopped for and wrapped and got everybody everything. He's not going to answer, ask for any of that. He's going to ask you the same question he asked the disciples back in the day. Did you love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, and with all of your soul? And did you love your neighbor? God is with us for now. We are here. Let it count. Let's make a difference. Let's not be like the rest of the world. Let's think first of God carving that time out and not feeling guilty for resting, for sleeping, and for prayer, because that's what's most critical. Even after we die, people will make pies and go shopping for Christmas toys and stuff. That's not what's critical here. God bless all of us. God bless our families. May Almighty God give us the actual grace that we need as we encounter and approach Advent, our Thanksgiving and Advent, in these special times of family and friends, that which counts the most. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.